let's start this week's session. Uh, welcome to the Virtual World ISB Week 3. You are now the SL residence officially. You are you know how to walk, you know how to talk and communicate. And now you're going to experience today the first live guided tour in Second Life. This tour is special in a way because we're going to visit some other island other than our campus since now we were always uh, around our campus area either here or the fountain area or so on now you're gonna see totally different somewhere and um, we will have a guest uh, the owner of that island um, she's going to make a guided tour uh, she's going to present her island to us and while doing so she's going to use her voice and we will also try to help with text while she's speaking during the tour as much as we could okay and uh, some of the terms that they are you they, that she's gonna use is about the marine life or the nature uh, and so on and I will try to um, write or type certain things in Turkish as well for the Turkish students uh, which is tricky sometimes those uh, name of the fishes or something like that so I'll try to help there as well as much as I could during the tour that is uh, what I used to do in the previous years as well and um... Hi, I am next to where Magua is just walk to Yes, I'm over in front of the posters. To my right is uh, John Loria, who is also a curator and organizer and uh, driving force. So, I want to welcome everyone here to the Abyss Observatory. Um, I'm Delia Lake, and in this Second Life, and in my uh, solid world life, I have focused all my work on sustainability. In that other world, um, my work goes from the personal and what we all do as individuals regarding sustainability to working, training, and consulting with companies, corporations, enterprises, and working on a global level. Um, here in Second Life, uh, I have for the last 17 years worked on environmental education and understanding ecosystems, doing presentations and builds that uh, further that. <coughs> I've been a curator here at the Abyss Observatory for what, about 15 years, um, and I am delighted this morning to have here also Jan Loria, who is um, the main person here at the Abyss Observatory so far as builds go and if you look behind you all of the welcome area and all of the exhibit on the tower behind us is Jan's work. Um, so th that's the long way of saying this is a collaborative effort and all sustainability is a collaborative effort. None of us can do this alone. Um, the funding for this is from uh, a few different organizations and individuals from Singapore to Japan to other places in the world. And there is a whole team of people who work on this. So although I am your primary tour guide today, I am absolutely not the only one who's contributed to all of this work. Yeah. 
So if you are really serious about sustainability, collaboration, learning, working across of uh, different disciplines, working across different kinds of studies and research is very, very important. Before we leave this area, um, the posters behind me have HUDs. There are uh, information about different kinds of environmental areas, and Jan has put HUDs in all of them so that you can go to these places and find out more about them. And Jan, before we go and tour anything underwater, would you like to say a few um, more things to the students here? There are a couple of other things that I would like to say. And Jan, please do type or speak at any time. But asking questions goes for everybody here. This is not a set script tour. This is a conversation about ecosystems and why ecosystems are so important. And so, all of your questions are equally as important as what I might have to say. So it is my intent to walk or swim people through undersea areas, set some of the uh, information and context, but the most important thing here is for you all to look around and think no. about what these things mean, what, why we would even do this, um, and ask your own questions. So a little bit about why, to start, we would do this, is that although we tend to be very focused on what human beings do and think. Um, none of us, human life would not exist without the support of a nature, without the support of many thousands of ecosystems that we draw our, our air, our water, our food, our livelihoods from. So protecting these ecosystems takes understanding what they are, how they work, and how they fit together. So before we walk across the bridge to the island, is there, are there any questions that you all have? Sirium, yes, ecosystems change all the time. They change because they are living systems. They evolve over time. They evolve some change in a short term, but many change over thousands and millions of years. Some of the coral species have been, and some of the other marine species have been around on Earth for 150 million years, a few 300 million years. So ecosystems do change. Okay, 
So we are going to start by walking across the bridge and down to the right. But as you're on the bridge, look down at the water and see the, the different research ships. Because we know what we know, not only from diving underwater, but because around the world, many countries have uh, sponsored research ships for scientists and students to gather information. But if you follow me across the bridge, Over here, this way, to the bridge, everybody. I see it was ass. You're looking sharp. Down the steps to your right. Down the steps to the right. Down towards the boat, everybody. We should tell people how to turn off the music as well, because if, if people are hearing that, it might be disturbing them. Looks like we have people within range now. Okay. So we are now in a mangrove forest. Mangrove forests are uh, found on, in tropical coastal areas around the world. There are oh, somewhat over 300 species of mangroves. They all have a similar function and they all have some similar characteristics. They are along the coast areas and uh, in some of the estuary, coastal estuaries, so small rivers. If you look at the mangroves, you will see that they have um, a unique root system. The root system uh, is spread out but deep and wide, and you can they are above the sand. They start above the sand. Um, that's important because the mangroves, one of the values of mangroves is that they catch the debris and they build beach areas. They also protect from storms. So they protect the inland areas from storms on sea. But because they collect uh, all sorts of materials and they also provide habitats for hundreds and hundreds of other creatures. 
they are salt tolerant so that they can t be in the salt water and extract the fresh water that they need from the salt water. Uh, salt water will kill a lot of plants, but the mangroves thrive in salt or brackish environments. So as you walk down onto the beach and look around, you will see a lot of other creatures that are right there uh, on the shore and in the mangroves. So let's walk down the stairs and tell me what you see when you get down there. What are some of the things that you see here on the shore? Yeah, the blue crab, <clears throat> the blue crabs. So mostly you see crabs in the water or crawling along the ground or the sand. Blue crabs climb trees. Yes, pelicans are found along mangrove swamps. Or there are fish, lots of different kinds of fish. If you look carefully, <laughs> yeah, uh, over where Jan is, there is a, a crocodile. In fact, there are a couple of crocodiles. So crocodiles are uh, coastal as well. Let's hope these, these couple of crocodiles have already eaten their meal and don't go for Jan or John. If you look, you will also find snakes and way around um, to my right you'll find a tiger yes tigers do swim yeah mangroves yes and no they uh filter a little but primarily their the roots are going to catch the um, the debris and provide the growth for for other plants and animals. So they the mangrove areas are critical for um, for the survival of other species that are well protected within the, the roots of the, the mangroves. So, this whole tour is a, a relatively brief overview. And um, if any of you wish to learn more, I would be glad to have you come back 
And if there's a public area, you can come back by yourself, or I would be glad to meet you here at any time and talk more about any of the things that we see. If we are going to, we are going to go underwater here, there are two ways you can do this. You can either um, jump off and swim. There are swimming um, animation swimmers to my left here, which you can click and dive under. There is also one down below if you just jump off. Or if you prefer, you can walk down the tube because John has built a uh, walking tube around this entire island. So it's your choice whether you want to swim or walk. If you wish to Um, the hammering sound that you hear is under sea and it is actually, um, one of the animals hitting, hitting the, uh, the land. So, um, this is not, not a feature. <laughs> one, one of the creatures, one of the fish, uh, is hitting the land. Yeah, you can leave the the walking um, to that any time and and swim if you wish. I am going to go under and swim. I will see you down below in the the uh, coral reef, the tropical coral reef, in a minute. Signs are usually in more than one. Right. I I am um, just over w closer to where John is. I am further back. Yes. I am in the water, about level with the. Okay. Yes. I'm right. Magua was right in front of me a minute ago. Okay. I, I know, I know, this is wonderful. So if you look below, you will see a tropical coral reef, or a series of them. This is representative of tropical coral reefs around the world. It is not specific to any particular one. Um, you will see a variety of coral. They look like plants. They are not plants. They are animals. Some of them are soft corals and some of them are hard corals, or what is called that. The hard corals have um, skeleton structures that um, remain when the soft tentacles die off and the next generation of coral is built on top of the, um, on top of the ancestor 
uh, structures. So some of the coral reefs are thousands and thousands of years old. Yeah, Jan is now riding one of the whales, yes. So have any of you been diving anywhere to see coral, a coral reef? They are very magnificent in uh, that solid world as well. Um, but I want to talk just a little bit about why this is important and um, what is happening to the coral reefs. This again is you see the coral having the basic structure of the ecosystem, but you see many, many different kinds of fish around here um, and you see whales and you see porpoises uh, and you see um, there are also shellfish these all are living together some of these are uh, very abundant and some of them are few so there is a rhythm of prey and predator, as with any ecosystem, living ecosystem. Most coral reefs around the world, most tropical coral reefs, are under a lot of stress right now. They're under stress from uh, climate change and the heating of the ocean in particular, but they are also under stress from human activity, such as fishing with trawlers that dredge an area and it scrapes everything off the bottom. They are under stress from uh, human settlements along the coast where there is um, effluent from human activity that is put into the water. And uh, some of it is toxic. Some of it is uh, super nutrient. And so the ecosystems go out of balance. A couple of other things here is that these coral, um, tropical corals, like where we are now, um, are not very deep. So they may be below the water surface, um, three meters, eight meters, maybe even uh, 10 meters, but not so deep that they don't get sunlight. They do get sunlight. But these, although we see them as brightly colored, the color is not a property of the coral itself. There are algae that live within the cells of the coral. And it is the algae that gives the coral its color and the algae that through photosynthesis feed these coral. When the temperature gets too hot in the water, corals will expel their algae. And then they no longer have the capacity to have food because it is the algae through photosynthesis that provides them with food. And that's part of what happens with bleaching and uh, coral die-off. 
But I want to point out over here along the edge um, something that is pretty recent in research. Here, right in front of me, as I'm walking on the ground, uh, the ground here, you will find two ordinary looking discs. These are plate coral. Plate coral are uh, found in the Indo-Pacific regions naturally. Um, also in the Red Sea. But they are um, being studied intensely right now because the um, properties of the plate coral as well as the algae that inhabit them seem to be more temperature resistant and scientists are working to figure out how to save coral reefs around the world to make them resilient in higher temperatures. So researchers are taking little pieces of these plate coral and um, putting them in different conditions of water temperature to then um, be able to breed the ones that are the most resistant to the, the uh, changes in temperature. So there's a lot of interesting things that are going on um, in the marine sciences research right now, today, that are brand new. So if any of you have any interest in this, it is a, um, a growing field. Before we leave the tropical coral area, do you have questions? While you okay, so when researchers are measuring the effects of climate change, they're using a handful of different baselines. Um, and when they're measure, so they're measuring not only the changes basically in sea surface temperature year after year after year for recorded history of you know, pretty well recorded for the last, 70 years and some recorded earlier than that but they are also using um, the inferences from um, what from sediments and the creatures that lived in these areas uh, for hundreds of years and sometimes when they're doing when they're able to do uh, particularly Antarctic, but also Arctic areas and measure the temperatures, they are measuring from um, ice cores so that they can have a pretty good um, estimate of temperatures thousands of years back in the Arctic and Antarctic. But here in the uh, warmer areas, they have to go by what was living here. Um, if you're trying to go back further than about 70 years. Um, my first involvement with this was in the late 
1970s um, and uh, doing some work with in the United States with uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Agency and some with NASA and uh, knowing people who were actually doing the temperature measurements in the oceans, uh, researchers. So um, it has changed in that time, uh, heated on average, uh, you know, you, you're not looking at what sounds like so much. You're looking at a couple of degrees Celsius at the most, but that makes a tremendous change in different locations. So it may be a lot warmer in the water in some locations because they're looking at averages. Does that sort of answer your question and help? We have a number of habitats here, so if you want to come back here and have more questions, I'd be glad to do that with you, or you can come back by yourself. But we are going to, I am going to move around now uh, to the temperate areas, because we, they will change significantly. We will still see some corals, but we will see um, many more uh, algae plants and grasses and different kinds of animals so if you follow the path around or swim um, behind me I will see you in a grassy area No idea. I always get lost at this point. Um, I don't know where she's gone and I can't identify her on the map, but we're well spread out. grassy area, but I was never able to find a grassy area. She said timber region, but it's not on the list here. This happens every time down sidearm, doesn't it? Okay. Oh, yep. 
this way. Follow us. That's not very helpful. <laughs> Too well. Looks like we have most of the people back again. So we are now in uh, one of the temperate marine areas. So temperate is the colder but not frigid area where most of us live. I'm in the United States. Uh, many of you are in uh, Turkey or Europe. Um, we have people from Ireland, all temperate range. So this below us is ear grass. It is another nursery area. Um, if you look, you will find little fish. You will also find um, shellfish. A lot of the fish that we eat a lot of the seafood that you and I eat come from, get spawned in this kind of nursery area. Um, if you look, you will see some shellfish that are uh, scallop shells. Um, scallops swim by opening and closing. They don't actually swim. They open and have the, let the water in, close their shells, and the water comes out and pushes them along. So it looks like they're still. The one creature I want to focus on here is below me. And you will see a horseshoe crab. Um, does anybody know one of the important uses of horseshoe crabs for us humans right now? So horseshoe crabs, yeah, they are involved in the development of medications for us. And uh, horseshoe crabs are very ancient creatures. Our blood is red, and it is uh, the hemoglobin is um, has iron that makes our blood red. Uh, horseshoe crabs have light blue blood, and they have copper-based blood. What that does is, in the development of our vaccines and medications, if you add, if you can, the, um, the use of the blood of the horseshoe crabs is that it will detect when there is toxic bacteria. So in order to make our vaccines and our medications safe, 
they are tested on horseshoe blood. So um, right now, horseshoes are captured and about a third of their blood in each horseshoe is removed and then they are supposed to be returned to the sea. Well, that does damage them because they are not as resilient as you would not be if a third of your blood were removed. Um, but it is important to humans to have safe vaccines. So there are some researchers who have uh, been developing artificial horseshoe crab blood to be able to do this same function. So another, another opportunity for uh, work and business here. Um, so we depend on all of these creatures who are marine creatures and we depend on the ecosystem like this being um, strong and uh, having integrity so that we can continue to benefit from them without destroying them. We are now going to move a little bit to the um, the north, and uh, we will take uh, right on suggestion and put signs down here for the future. go along and um, ask again that people who, when you get there, look around and note what you see. And note in any ecosystem what you think makes it stay together. What might be keystone species that if you remove them, the whole thing collapses. So here, for instance, although it may not look interesting, if you remove the eel grass, everything else goes away. Everything. I've lived in places where that has happened, where they have removed the eel grass uh, because humans didn't like swimming over it. And all of the animals that lived there moved away, are gone. And they've been gone now for 50 years. So, um, look at what you think would happen. What are the keystone species that keep an ecosystem together? It will change, but if you remove some of them, it's like playing a Jenga game. You can remove some blocks, and they will still, it, the tower will still stand. But all of a sudden, you remove one and everything collapses. I'm going to swim to the north here. to the kelp forest area. There's a big sign saying kelp forest and you'll see some of us gathering here already.
health likes colder water. Kelp is also found around the world. And um, we use kelp for lots of different things. Although this is called a kelp forest, kelp is not a plant. It looks like a plant. But kelp is algae. There are many different kinds of kelp. Um, they are in uh, temperate areas in many different areas of the world. What are some of the things that you see here? Yeah. Stingrays? Yes. You will see sharks. Sea urchins. So Magua mentioned sea urchins, and this is a critical part here regarding the kelp. But first let me say, you probably know kelp because you probably have eaten it. Kelp is nutritious for humans, um, and we do eat it in many forms. In powdered form as additions to food as thickener uh, as the uh, wrapping on uh, sushi um, we eat kelp there are also variations of kelp and uh, seaweed that we use for not only food but for cosmetics. Um, the Irish students may be familiar with Irish moss which is related but not the same. Um, and kelp is also under stress. People have talked about using kelp for energy sources, for harvesting kelp to use as energy sources rather than cold. Um, but if we don't take care of an ecosystem, we're not going to be able to do that successfully. As now let's get back to the sea urchins for a minute. Sea urchins can eat, eat kelp by the kilograms um, daily. So if a sea urchin population moves into a kelp area, it will eat all of the kelp and the kelp will be gone. Um, so Sirium noted that there's otters here. One of the favorite foods of sea otters is sea urchins. So it's the otters and the um, um, some of the starfish that are the um, the saviors of the kelp forest. If the sea, if they keep the sea urchins under control, then the kelp forest will flourish. The algae will keep growing and flourish. 
So this is how this ecosystem stays in balance. It has a whole set of keystone species that work together that one eats one thing, another one eats another thing, and it keeps everything in balance. But if you remove the sea otters, for instance, like they did a hundred years ago on the coast of California, they killed off the sea otters because the sea otters also ate the abalone that the fishermen wanted. And so when they killed off the sea otters, they eliminated the whole ecosystem. The whole ecosystem began to collapse. Um, Sirium, yes, there are cycles of things, of animals, yes, and they're not always in the same number. But if you remove an entire species that is one of the balancing species, the ecosystem collapses. So when the, sea ur when the otters were removed, the sea urchins moved in and ate the kelp. And so the people who were then harvesting kelp had no more kelp to harvest. So this is why looking at an entire system is important, not just looking at a particular species, but how does it all work together? And yes, to go back to the question of the implied question in evolution. Uh, one of the uh, species here in this system is um, mackerel. So mackerel and sardines uh, are in the same family, herring, same family. But mackerel, for instance, uh, and the menhaden have about a 60-year cycle where they um, the population grows and the population shrinks and the population grows and that's normal. But if they are overfished, that interrupts that normal evolved cycle. And when some a fish like the sardines or like the mackerel or like the menhaden which were overfished in the United States the menhaden then again the ecosystem collapses because you don't have the enough of the uh, prey species to feed the other species so humans by overfishing or by destroying a habitat interrupt it. So this is a critical system here, this kelp forest, for us in, who live in the temperate area. Let's, do you have questions before? For we, uh, the fish that looks like a plate, the the mola mola, down below you, it is. It's uh, sometimes called ocean sunfish. Uh, they're often found. They were back in the coral, the tropical coral reef as well. Uh, it is a, a very ancient bony fish. It does look weird. It doesn't, looks like somebody cut off the back of it. Um, their favorite uh, prey is jellyfish. 
So when you saw them on the, yeah, you can see them. Yes. They love jellyfish. Yes. They keep the jellyfish population in check. But they are a very, very bony, ancient fish. And they're in tropical and temperate wow, 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 areas. Wow, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And all of the bony fish have more more bones than meat. It's really hard to get any meat off some of these fish. Um, as we move north from here, we are going to move into a subarctic area, a cold water region. The cold water regions have only been recently explored a lot. And as they've been explored, we've found thousands of species we didn't know about before. Yes. Okay, yes. Okay. So, so far we have been in areas that are relatively warm and have been explored and fished for centuries. The cold water areas uh, are too cold to go diving without special equipment or uh, without submersible vehicles. So they have only been explored in relatively recent years. So as a for instance, we didn't know that there were cold water and deep water coral reefs that are quite different from the tropical coral reefs. We didn't know that until you know, a handful of decades ago. So when we move into the cold water area, we will be in a cold, a new kind of, new to us kind of coral reef. You will notice that these other corals do not have color. They are too deep to use photosynthesis. And we'll talk more about those when we get there. But when you get there, look around and note the differences between what you've seen so far and what there is in the uh, cold water and deep water coral areas. Um, and below, if you walk on the path, you will take an elevator down to the next level if you wish. Um, Jan has built elevators here, and way below, you will see, and we won't really go down there, but there is a, uh, a whole area with uh, a hot water um, undersea, it's not water really, it's a, where uh, hot chemicals get spewed out of the um, the bottom of the ocean. And you'll find uh, some worms there 
and you will find other creatures that cannot live anywhere else. They are deep water creatures that live in very, very high pressure water and very hot and chemical laden water. But it's worth going down and exploring that as well. Uh, right now I'm going to move north and into the, the cold water coral area. Not in the laboratory. We're uh, we're in the um, above corals. It's a giant squid floating above us. corals and note how different they look. Some of these corals they have found are 10,000 years old. So a um, replicating family of corals is essentially the same organism but it keeps growing on itself on itself on itself. They do not have color. They are too deep to have sunshine reach them. So they do not have the photosynthesis. So what do you think they do? How do they eat? Any guesses? Yeah, plankton is a really, really important component of this ecosystem for many reasons. It's not only the coral that eat wow. the plankton, but the, all of the, the baleen whales. The baleen whales are the, um, like the, the blue whale that have, kind of looks like instead of teeth curtains that they uh, filter the water. They open their mouths and filter the water and uh, keep the, all of the critters inside. So they also have, uh, you'll see what looks like sort of scum in the water that is more than just the plankton. It is any of the um, 
decaying detritus that might be around here that the corals grab and eat. Um, this again is a very rich habitat. Um, and you'll see here uh, some king crabs and some um, snow crabs. But the king crabs are almost gone from this area because they have been over harvested. And just a couple of years ago, the snow crab population uh, in the Arctic collapsed. And by collapsed, I mean it went from millions and millions of individuals to very few. And nobody knows exactly why yet, but the research is leading to it is warmer water that killed them off. And it happened in only a couple of years. So that areas that were rich crab harvesting areas are now quarantined. Nobody can fish in them. And these are off Alaska and Russia primarily. and hoping that they can bring these populations back. But when you take out a key species like that and remove it almost entirely, you never get back the same ecosystem that was here before because other things will fill in those functional spaces and you'll get a slightly different ecosystem. This is partly how evolution happens, but only partly. I want to go back to the plankton though for a minute because this is another key function here and um, a key characteristic. As I said, there are creatures that eat plankton that depend entirely on plankton and uh, migrating whales are one of those. So that the whales that, uh, say gray whales that um, birth their babies in the uh, Baja California area. So that's the U.S. California and um, east west coast of Mexico and that gulf there is a prime area for uh, birthing of gray whales. But then they migrate north to the Arctic to feed in the summer and uh, they feed on the plankton. But one of the, and plankton is not a universal kind of uh, a creature. It is composed of many, 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 many tiny kinds of creatures. So it can be the, the um, babies of the creatures that grow larger. So the tiny babies of a uh, squid, for instance, or any of the fish. But it also has creatures like copepods that stay small, that are always small. And copepods are a very interesting component of this ecosystem for us. They're tiny creatures that uh, live in, thrive in cold water. And when they are in very cold water, they um, develop fatty bodies. They are um, 
The whales depend on these and eat them by the millions. What has happened now, though, with the warming of the ocean water is that the copepods are not putting on as much fat. So the nutritional value of a, a copepod for a whale is less. So they have to eat more or they are um, nutritionally deficient. So that's one piece. But the other piece is that copepods are light sensitive as well as temperature sensitive. And they, in enormous groups of millions and millions, they rise to the surface and they sink. And they rise to the surface and they sink. And when these enormous groups of uh, copepods in the plankton do this daily, they turn the water to the degree of um, affecting the oxygen in the atmosphere. It's that big a deal. So they, uh, the carbon dioxide oxygen cycle is, that we need is affected by the rise and fall of the enormous groups of copepods. So, um, it's not the only way that we get uh, oxygen and atmospheric uh, interactions and churning between ocean water and our atmosphere, but is one of the important ways. So that when the copepods are less fat, they are less heavy, and there is less interaction between the water and the atmosphere. This is also beginning to be measured, so it's something to follow. Do we have questions so far? Because I have a few more things I want to add here about this area. As I said, these are cold water areas, these cold water corals and cold water creatures, um, and they're deep water. So we humans had thought not only that this didn't really exist in any great number, but also um, that we have so much of the ocean floor that has been not been explored, we did not realize that there are deep cold water coral and ecosystems around the world. Uh, there is a push now for the next 10 years uh, well, maybe less than that because it started a few years ago, to find 100,000 new species. Just in the last year, 2023, researchers have found upward of 5,000 new previously unknown species, marine species. So we are, um, we know nowhere's near enough about the deep underwater areas. 
that we now have conflicts set up between the people who want to exploit the research, uh, the areas, the, uh, the environments, and people who want to make sure we know and understand what is here. And so negotiating these conflicts is a really, really, really important thing right now. Yes, human beings need some of these resources for our lifestyles, or we need to change our lifestyles. But we also are uh, inadvertently removing some of the species we have not yet discovered that are likely to provide um, important functions like the horseshoe crabs do for our medical um, productions. So here there are a couple of areas that I want to highlight. One is uh, off the coast of Chile. Just this last year, they found an undersea mountain with a hundred species that nobody had seen before. So these are all new. There is an entire area um, between Hawaii and Mexico that is under consideration for mineral exploration and um, mining, where they have found just this past year uh, over a thousand new species that nobody had seen before. So how we negotiate these differences and ensure that we um, can have sustainability for humans and for the marine life is up to us from now on. Each one of us has a role to play in informing ourselves and to be a voice in these uh, processes and negotiated um, opportunities. Siren, that is a huge question, and I'd be glad to answer that another time. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you, Sidearm. Um, thank you very much, Delia. Uh, that was amazing tour again. Uh, I've been in your tours many times by now, but most of the students here and uh, some of the faculty are new to your tours. So I hope they enjoyed it as well. Um, we could do the debrief here, um, so we don't, we don't need to relocate, uh, since we can still be comfortable even deep under the water in Second Life. And um, we, so I, I would like to open the ground for uh, students and the uh, uh, new faculty member especially, uh, to share their likes and wishes about these tours and you know what what they have seen what they have learned what do they think about it and uh, how do you, how do they think that uh, this tour was beneficial for them so please um, feel free to 
make your comments on text uh, and if you want to speak on voice just uh, raise your hand or I don't know like just give us a signal with the mic so that we could hear you as well so thank you again very welcome my pleasure in doing this Anyone would you, would like to start with uh, likes and wishes? Wow! What did you like about this tour, and what what would you wish about it to make it even better? Okay, Sirium says she likes all of it. And she would like to see economic and political insights. Uh, Rola says also um, she likes it. Sight made a comment during the tour that there would, if uh, there would be some milestones or like, you know, some signs for us where to meet, where to stop. That will be nice because we always get lost uh, in transition in the tour, uh, he says. Uh, especially some of our students are new, so. Quantifying the damage, putting an economic lens can help to communicate to skeptics. Sabrina says, welcome. Uh, says uh, she's, she thanks for your welcoming tour. John O'Connor says, uh, I love the rich detail provided during the tour. Also wish a diving suit. Maybe we should provide it to everyone, John, next time. I think this is perfect example of flexibility in learning and this can help to provide to inclusive educational strategies as well, which Leah says. By the way, Leah is uh, Leah is Roa, Roa is Leah, so uh, I'm just sometimes mixing the names and then uh, Leah is a professor of education, so uh, she's, she's studying pedagogies and so on. And Anyone else? Okay, Tall Ninja. It's amazing how every detail, every little detail is considered and connected into the ecosystem to help balance and maintain equilibrium. Thanks for the tour. I love the fact that this is a lesson along the way. Maybe it can be shown what happens to animals as a result of bad scenario if precautions are not taken into the re in a region. The raw says the content and dosing of the course was great as well. Inclusive, immersive, experiential learning, I believe, is critically important to understanding and retention. Delia says. So, I like the like fact that every time you also updated Delia, like you 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 talk about something new or 
some some minor detail that I have missed maybe the last time so on. So every time, even though I, I have done it like a couple of times, it feels like I'm doing something new, which is good. Oh, thank you. Yes, I do try to do that all the time. Yes. Yeah. And um, yes, education needs more interactive approaches, Sirium says. Roa agrees. So some of the students who, who didn't make comments, anyone else would like to make a comment? We would like to hear your voice. This is the main reason of this debrief. For the researchers here in class, Delia, I appreciate your abil ability to immediately reference sources. Um, who, who didn't make comments? Let me ch check around and see who didn't make any comments. Maya, would you like to add something? Vivian, would you like to add something? Um, Shahin, would you like to add something? Doa? Alper, Seri, Sergio, Orientals. Being curious, why did you create this space? What is your motivation? A question to you, Ilya. So, um, my initial motivation is, as I said, that my my work in all lives is in sustainability and has been for many decades. Um, when years and years and years ago, I lived on uh, Cape Cod, which is the eastern North Atlantic, it's the North Atlantic uh, eastern part of the United States. Uh, Cape Cod Bay and the Gulf of Maine, if you look at a map, and uh, I was fortunate enough to be close to the shore and be able to walk on the beach and swim and dive every day for the years I was there. Uh, that's when I first saw the effect of removing the eelgrass when they were doing construction of new condominiums and I in the winter time when it is allowed my children and I would put on boots hip waders and high gloves that went up to our shoulders and uh, wire uh, baskets and walk in the frigid water and collect scallops and take them home and eat them for dinner. When the eelgrass was dredged away, the bay scallops in Cape Cod Bay disappeared and they have never come back. So that not only made me sad, it made me um, want to know more and where else this was happening. Then, uh, a few years later, I had the opportunity to be working with the United States federal government and doing uh, data collection work um, and coordination of activities among different federal agencies like NASA, and NOAA, and also the U.S. Navy, and learn a lot more about the undersea marine areas from the scientists who are actually out in the field doing the research. And one of my jobs was to make sure that the researchers in the Navy were talking with the researchers in NOAA. Uh, and so I had at a very early time an opportunity to see a broad section of how systems 
were, marine systems were, and how people, both the military and the fishing, uh, fishermen and the scientists were or were not working together. And to be one of the people who encouraged the uh, good communication among them and in that way help to protect some of these environments. So in doing that, I realized firsthand how very, very important each of the, these are to our human lives, to our day-to-day -day living, even when we do not recognize it in the food we eat, in the mineral resources, in the weather systems, uh, because I was in a position to work with and coordinate the activities among all of the people who were doing this hands-on field work. So it allowed me a pretty unique way of looking at global environmental systems. And I have continued doing that ever since. Um, and uh, to go back to what some of Sirim's questions, um, those are questions that do not fit in this tour, but some Thing that I would be glad to do at another time, maybe a presentation for a virtual world's education consortium or something like that, where I'm also a member in Second Life and do some presentations. Because that does fit in the work that I do, just not in this tour. And it's really important because the we are at a time in human history where things are changing rapidly. We are on the cusp of a new normal, politically, environmentally, socially, around the world. Uh, so I think this is a very important area to be talking about and learning about. Um, and if we make these changes without thinking about them or without considering the systems that are key to our survival and how the different systems interact, we are going to be in a lot of trouble as a species. Uh, in terms of our individual lives, we think of human beings as having been around for a very long time. In terms of Earth's history, we are just a blip on the screen. Um, and we, like other species, um, evolve and can become extinct. I would prefer that my uh, children, my grandchildren's grandchildren do not be extinct. So uh, that's one of the motivations of my doing what I'm doing. I think we are at a time when what we do can make a difference. Okay, thank you, Delia. And Sirium makes a comment, yes, if we don't change, we're going to exterminate ourselves. So, time for change, huh? Yes. Change is happening regardless. Yes. Is, do we, are we going to guide these changes from um, an informed position or not? Or are we just going to go ahead um, and 
and not pay attention to what we're doing. Yeah, so, something I noticed during the COVID-19 um, shutdowns and so on, um, we kind of had uh, we kind of had some, um, you know, it was coming back. The nature was coming back. Like we 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 even saw some whales in the shores of Mediterranean here. Like the fish were coming to uh, near the where we were living, and we uh, one of the shutdowns uh, we had a summer house next to the Mediterranean and. Uh, we, we kind of went there shut for the shutdown and there there's nobody around so we were even going out to the shore and so on and see that the nature was coming back like coming back alive again when when the human are gone so the only thing basically maybe we should do is not interfere with nature or keep it at the minimum level then it the nature will do the trick anyway yeah, that, that's uh, part of keeping, um, conserving an ecosystem. It doesn't mean that we can't be among the predators in a system, but we cannot uh, be the ones, the predator that uh, breaks down the integrity of an ecosystem and expect it to still support us. So we have to be careful. We have to be watching um, what we can take out of a system, what we need to live in a system that it maintains the system integrity. So for instance, what I was saying about the, the small fish, the menhaden that and the 60-year cycle. We can take more of fish like the Menhaden when it is at the peak of its cycle than we can when it is at the, the lowest point of its cycle. Um, if we try to take the same amount from the lowest point of the population as we take from the highest point of the population the system uh, I, i'm sorry to interrupt for the uh, students who are uh, taking part in this course uh, also taking part in the student challenge that was a different way of presenting a topic what which delia did today so um, you're seeing examples of the 3d immersive learning environments and teaching environments uh, in a way uh, so that is what you're going to create for your student challenge this term. So that is one big example of what could be done in immersive 3D. And that is really uh, one of the best ones also, which I participated in years here.